Hi, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have absolute faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and exalt in the surrender of my body, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Good to have you along, everybody. Thanks for your company this morning. Where would you rather be on a Sunday morning? Okay, I'm going to pray and we're going to look at this uh, familiar passage of Scripture. Um, just earlier, uh, Liz said something really meaningful, I thought, about who are we? It's interesting, it's a question that gets asked a lot. You watch the TV, who are we? What's my identity? You know, the funny thing about that, you only know who you are when you realise whose you are. Ah. You see the point? If you know whose you are, then you know who you are. So it's a silly question to ask, who am I? You should be asking, whose am I? And then you can make that determination. Let me pray. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity you've afforded us this morning within the context of this day to spend time learning. We recognise, Lord, a failure to learn, an unwillingness to learn is one of the greatest inhibitors and distractive factors to personal growth and maturity and development. We all need to learn. We all need to be trained, educated. We all need to be challenged with what is true because we have this inherent tendency to go astray and believe distortions and half-truths and perversions. Father, we thank you for this uh, record. Even though it was written so long ago, it has relevance for us in the here and now. Written by the Apostle Paul to the believers at Corinth. And we pray, Lord, that we would learn significantly from it, that you would impress your word upon our hearts in order that we may leave this place more changed in our thinking and subsequent behaviour. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've been listening to um, music on my car radio ever since I got my driver's licence at 16 and nine months. So about 20 years ago, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry. And judging by the frequency with which the word is mentioned in the top 20, it has become very clear to me that the single answer to the world's relational conflicts and family breakdown and global terrorism and domestic violence is love, is love. And it's not difficult to agree with such a thought when you consider what hate does to the world, the misery and suffering it inflicts, the violence it perpetrates, the damaged people, the communities, the countries, the cultures that are destroyed by it. I mean, it's almost plausible to say in the words of the Beatles, all you need is love. Or to quote Jackie Del Shannon, what the world needs now is love, sweet love, not just for some, but for everyone. According to her song, we don't need any more rivers to cross or mountains to climb. What we need is love for everyone, for everyone. But I would submit, friends, it's one thing to sing about it. It's another thing altogether to do it, to do it. 
Love songs are often, often met with great approval, not application. And I think we all would be in agreement that love could bring about enduring reconciliation in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, Russia, and I could go on and on and on and on here, couldn't I? Curry, Cessna, Maitland, Wallenby, further afield. Uh, love could make marriage what God intended it to be, a visual relational symbol that points towards Jesus Christ's relationship with his bride, the church. Now, anything else is just developing a mutually satisfying relationship. That means you're in trouble. In summary, we all know that love can make the world a much better place to live, a much better place to live. Therefore, if everyone gives approval in principle to the importance and the significance of love, why is it so elusive? Why is it so elusive? Why is, a common, why is love a common word but an uncommon practice? And often those who use the word the most understand it the least. Some years back, an attractive young woman uh, came to the office of a pastor, um, desperate and despondent. She said, my boyfriend loves me so much, he's going to kill himself if I don't marry him. What should I do? Don't marry him replied the pastor. This man does not love you, he loves himself. Such love, such love is just pure selfishness and manip manipulation. See, friends, I would maintain that there's a stream performance gap between theory and practice, isn't there? Between theory and practice. And it's not difficult to understand why. Our culture has trivialised love. We've sentimentalised love. We've emotionalised love. If you want to know if he loves you so, it's in his kiss. <laughs> Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? Is that right? I grew up listening to Jim Morrison and the Doors. Hello, I love you. Why don't you tell me your name? What about Melissa Etheridge? Does she love you, infatuate and haunt you? Does she stimulate, stimulate and attract to captivate you? Does she miss you existing just to kiss you? Does she inject you, seduce you and affect you like the way I do? Kill me now. You see, the love you hear in contemporary music, friends, is often portrayed as a, a passion, an unfulfilled desire, an emotion. They describe long as a loving, a love as a longing, a passion. It's like a craving, an addiction that is never really satisfied. But not only have most love songs reduced love to an emotion, but you may have noticed they've also made it involuntary. Did you know that? Love's involuntary. People fall in love as if it was an accident. Strange. They get swept off their feet by love as if they had no say in the matter. I ran under a bus. I got hit by a train. It's an accident, you see. Fallen in love is kind of the same. I sunk out at sea, crashed my car, got insane, and it felt so good I want to do it again. What about Ed Sheeran? He's up to speed, right? People fall in love in mysterious ways, maybe the touch of a hand. Me, I fall in love with you every single day. Maybe it's just part of a plan. If you listen carefully, if you've listened carefully to the words of the Apostle Paul written to the believers at Corinth, friends, you would have noticed that love cannot simply be an emotion that is involuntary. It cannot simply be an emotion that is involuntary. All those virtues or aspects of love involve your mind and your volition. They're the outworking of your will. Love is a, primarily a decision you make. And, of course, the supreme example of love, the ultimate example of love, is God's love. God's love was expressed in giving and sacrifice. Now, did not Jesus underscore this when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son? See, love expresses itself in the giving of yourself. 
And at the end of the day, the only true gift you have is the giving of yourself. And if you want to know how much you love a person, it's in, you find it in how much you're willing to give of yourself to that person, how much you're willing to be generous and sacrificial and selfless. So God's love was expressed in giving and sacrifice, which involves the mind and volition. Now, friends, it's not my intention to be insensibly critical. Um, and while you're looking at the faults of others, you're not seeing them in yourself, are you? So you need to be very careful. And it might seem a nice romantic sentiment to characterise love as a, you know, an uncontrolled passion or an involuntary emotion. But a great lover is not someone who romances a different partner every month, but the same partner for a lifetime, for a lifetime. And those who think biblically will know that such love is both selfish and irrational. It's far removed from the biblical teaching of love, far removed from the biblical understanding of love. Love, according to the Bible, is not a helpless sensation of desire. Love, according to the Bible, is not an involuntary passion. No, 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 no. Love, according to the Bible, is primarily a purposeful act of self-giving. It's primarily an act of your will and it expresses itself, it demonstrates itself in the giving of yourself. In other words, being sacrificial. In the giving of yourself. So love is deliberately devoted, intentionally devoted to the one loved. True Christian love, therefore, has its origin in your will. It arises out of the will, not in blind emotion, it is above all generous and sacrificial. And of course, friends, we see that love, do we not, in all its majestic fullness embodied in the person of Jesus. You do. Because he expressed that love in taking our place on that hideous, brutal, callous Roman cross in order to take the penalty and take the punishment for our sin. You see that love in all its majestic fullness. Karen and I have four children. And if I've used this illustration before, friends, I make no apology. Karen and I have four children, Joshua, Amelia, Matthias and Cohen. If one of those children was in a life-threatening situation, let's say, for example, if one of those children was drowning off Nobby Beach, Nobby's Beach, and if one of you was drowning off Nobby Beach, Nobby's Beach, and I can swim out and I can only save one person, you're on your own. Seriously. I know it's funny, but seriously, you're on your own. But friends, is it not a selfless love? Is it not a sacrificial love that God watches his own son die on a hideous, horrid, brutal, callous Roman cross in order to reach out and save you? I wouldn't have done it, and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have done it. He reaches out and saves you at the expense of his own son. In 1 John 4.10, we read these words, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's love in all its majestic fullness is found in Jesus being made a public spectacle of on a brutal Roman cross. And you know, it's from that cross he reaches out. It's from that cross he reaches out to all who will take him by the hand. He reaches out to all who are simply living to please themselves and says, repent, turn away from sin, turn away from sin and self-will. Turn away from living to please yourself and trust me to save you. Trust me. Now, I want you to imagine one of the most corrupt cities on earth, a city where relationships were self-centered and self-destructive. And that was the quality of life in the first century um, city of Corinth. Their culture was morally bankrupt and was spiritually impoverished, if you will. Wealth and materialism, along with a, 
sexually orientated religion had created a culture and a climate based on personal pleasure. It's what you call hedonism. And hedonism reigned supreme in the city of Corinth. Corinth became so notorious for its moral corruption that people in the Greek world who were guilty of, um, of uh, sexual immorality and drunkenness and debauchery were, were referred to as behaving uh, like Corinthians. Corinthians. And as you read through this letter of the Apostle Paul to the believers at Corinth, you quickly realise that the church in Corinth reflected its culture more than its creator. More than its creator. The well-known atheist of last century, Robert Ingersoll, would often stop in his lectures to his students and say, I'll give God five minutes to strike me dead for the things I've taught. He then used the fact that he was not struck dead as proof that God did not exist. The Reverend Theodore Parker said of Ingalls' claim, and did the gentleman think he could exhaust the patience of the eternal God in five minutes? The foolishness, you see. Five minutes. Friends, love practices being patient or long-suffering, if you have another translation. The Apostle Paul wrote in verse 4 of chapter 12, love is patient. Patience is the ability to, to, be, to be, patience is the ability to restrain oneself in the face of provocation. It's a word which is used of a person who is offended or sinned against and has it in their power to revenge themselves or avenge themselves, but they choose not to do so. They refrain from doing so. In the Greek culture, when Paul wrote this letter, self-sacrificing love and non-avenging patience were considered weaknesses. They were unworthy of a noble person, man or woman. Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, taught that, that uh, the great Greek virtue was refusal to tolerate insult and to strike back in retaliation at the slightest offence. Vengeance was seen in that culture as a virtue something to be practised, something to be upheld. And in the same way, our culture does it not celebrates and exalts those TV and movie heroes that take vengeance out on the opposition and annihilate the enemies. Psychologists write books extolling the virtues of blame shifting. Don't get angry, get even. Wrong. And, of course, the supreme example of patience, friends, is God's patience. Is it not? God's patience. It's God himself. You see, it's God's patient love that prevents the world from being destroyed. And it's his patient love that allows people time to come to the Saviour, Jesus. Since Adam and Eve first disobeyed, God has been continually defied and rejected. He's been continually sinned against and treated with contempt by those he has created and loves. And yet through the thousands of years, the eternal God has been patient, incredibly patient. If then the creator of all is so incredibly patient with his rebellious, disobedient, sinful, defiant creatures, how much more should his creatures be patient with each other? God has had it recorded. Love is patient. Love is patient. Two firemen were waiting in line at a fast food restaurant when the siren on their fire truck went off, just parked outside. And as they turned to leave, a couple who'd already received their order gave them their food so the firemen wouldn't go hungry. The couple then got back in line to reorder. Now, the manager of the fast food restaurant was pre present and he saw what they had done. And when they reordered, he said, them, he said to them, no fee, no fee, it's free, it's free. Friends, love is patient, but it's also kind. I think that's a really kind thing to do. It's also kind, according to verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind. See, being, being kind is the counterpart of being patient. To be kind means to be useful. It's like serving. It's like 
gracious. It's active goodwill. It not only feels generous, but is generous. Kindness is not merely concerned for the welfare or the well-being of others, but it actually works towards their welfare. Kind people will give away their food at their own expense. Kind people won't charge anyone who have been generous and considerate. And friends, if you want to know what kindness looks like, you need look no further than Jesus. You need look no further than Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of all kindness, let me assure you. For he committed the supreme act, the ultimate act of kindness, when he allowed himself to be subject to the greatest miscarriage of justice in human history. Why? To save his people from their sins. And this is endorsed by the words of the Apostle Paul when he wrote to Titus, who was on Crete. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared, he saved us. He saved us. He saved us. Kindness in all its majestic fullness, friends, is embodying it in the person of Jesus. You want to know what a kind person looks like? Look to Jesus every time, every time. 21-year-old Wu, I hope I pronounced his name right, Hisia, had broken up with his long-term girlfriend, Wu Tan, after meeting someone new. Over the next three months, um, jilted Jung Tan, sorry, Jung Tan, kept contacting and, and hassling and phoning Wu up, wanting to be reunited. Wu, in his great wisdom, thought it would be a good idea if the three of them um, met together and talked it out. But when they did, things went from bad to worse. The two girls began arguing. Wu's ex-girlfriend felt insulted by a comment that his current girlfriend had made, and so she jumped into the river and started calling on Wu to jump in and save her. Wu's current girlfriend, fearing that he might, jumped into the river herself. And then both women started calling out, calling out for Wu to save them. Friends, being jealous or being envious of what someone else has can make you behave in very peculiar ways, in very bizarre ways. It can even make you risk your own life, jeopardise your own life and make you jump in the river. Love, according to the Bible, according to verse 4, does not envy. It does not envy. So Christian love does not resent the blessings and the successes and the advancements of others. Envy has two forms. One form says, I want what someone else has. Pretty straightforward. If you have a better car, then I want it. If you have a better, bigger and better house than mine, then I want it. If you have a more attractive girlfriend, boyfriend, then I want them. I mean, that envy is bad enough, I, I would think. But a worse kind is... I wish you didn't have what you have. I wish you didn't have what you have. This envy is more self-centred. It's really like an infantile resentment. So love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. And verse 4, it does not boast. It does not boast. Friends, if you want to know what greatness looks like, buy yourself a dictionary. Open up and look, look to the word and you'll see a picture of me. Now, that was a statement made by English middleweight boxer Chris Eubank. Needless to say, he can't sleep past himself, right? Love, according to the Bible, does not boast. It doesn't brag about its accomplishments. It doesn't put itself on display. If, if, you, if you like, not even carefully worded statements of subtle self-promotion. And concisely, this reiterates the words of Solomon. Let another praise you. Let another praise you and not your own mouth. Not your own mouth. Love 
Let love, sorry, let another praise you and not your own mouth. Love does not parade its accomplishments. Love does not boast about its achievements. Love does not praise itself and promote itself and put itself first. You see, boasting is the other side of envy. Envy is wanting what someone else has. Boasting is trying to make others envious of what you have. It's ironic that as much as most of us dislike boasting in others, we're inclined to boast ourselves. But boasting always violates love, you see, because it seeks to exalt self at the expense of others. That's why Paul exhorted the Corinthian believers not to think too highly of themselves. Don't think too highly of yourself. The literary context of that statement is actually spiritual gifts. You see, the Corinthians were what they call show ponies, spiritual show ponies. And they were seeking the applause and the admiration and the approval of men. Consequently, their meetings were disorderly. And Paul had to instruct them. Paul had to say to them, let all things be done for, edific- for edification. You see, boasting about one's spiritual gifts is absurd and foolish. And that's simply because they're sovereignly given. They're sovereignly bestowed. And therefore, we cannot take credit for them. See, they're the outworking of the grace of God, not the ability of man. That's why Paul questioned the Corinthians. He said, what did you have that you did not receive? Really? And the same applies to our physical capabilities, our physical capabilities. It's all a gift from God, all a gift from God. Boasting puts ourselves first. Everyone else, including God, therefore must be of less importance to us. Jesus Christ, who had everything to boast about, never boasted. In fact, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thanks, Vic. The New Testament scholar John MacArthur. New Testament scholar John MacArthur in his book, The Legacy of Jesus, articulated his thoughts about pride in in these terms. We live in a proud, egotistical generation It's now considered acceptable, even normal, for people to promote themselves, to praise themselves, and to put themselves first. Pride is seen as a virtue by many. Humility, on the other hand, is seen as a weakness. And now you see this on the TV. I see this on TV all the time. No culture can survive pride run rampant, for all society relies on relationships. When people are committed first to themselves, relationships disintegrate. And that's just what is happening as marriages, families, and friendships fall apart. So love is patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. And it is not proud. It is not proud. Now, there's no question, friends, for for anyone who has eyes to see, there's an undeniable majesty about man. There's an undeniable greatness about mankind, about man. For we're the pinnacle of God's creation, are we not? We're in possession of uniqueness that is undeniable and nothing really can compete with us. Clearly, the developments of last century have been astonishing, especially in the fields of technology and medicine. And the possibilities for further improvement are immense, are immense. But human nature is such that pride kicks in. And the more we achieve, the more self-sufficient we become. The more ingenuity we display, the more arrogant we become. And I'll tell you this for free, God is not impressed because he knows everything comes from him and without him we are nothing and we will achieve nothing. Isaiah was right when he said, the arrogance of man will lie in the dust. The arrogance of man will be brought low. Their pride will lie in the dust. You see, friends, prideful people have an exaggerated opinion of their own importance and they find it easy to dismiss the needs and the feelings and the thoughts of others. But people who truly love do not conduct themselves in this way. They do not conduct themselves in this way. Love is not proud. It's not proud. In 1984, the 1984 uh, Olympic Games, um, after all the runners had finished the marathon, Gabriel Anderson came staggering in to the Los Angeles Coliseum. She could barely stand, much less walk 
successful run. To finish the race, she had to complete a lap of the track. I remember watching as she staggered and stumbled, you know, nearly falling beyond the point of exhaustion. The crowd, I remember, stood and cheered as she struggled, wanting her, desperately wanting her to finish the race. And as she staggered down the straightaway, her coach walked beside her, walked beside her, um, careful not to touch her, otherwise she would be disqualified. Then she crossed the finish line and collapsed into his arms, just absolutely exhausted, nearly unconscious. Gabriel Anderson, friends, that day persevered to the end and did not fail to finish the race. Concluding the description, his description of love, Paul wrote, writes in verse 7 and 8, love always perseveres, love never fails. Christian love goes the distance. Christian love does not give up. You might say Christian love is very tenacious. It does not give up in the face of opposition, hardship, struggle. And friends, we see all these aspects of love in all their fullness embodied in the person of Jesus. They're all there in Jesus. See, Jesus was patient. Jesus was kind. Jesus did not envy. Jesus did not boast. Jesus was not proud. Jesus persevered and his love never failed. And if you love and serve him as opposed to loving and serving yourself, you will persevere and your love will never fail. Let me pray. Amen. Father, we want to thank you for this ancient record that was written so long ago, but we can read it in the here and now and come away with understanding and come away with the determination to be people who are loving, people who intentionally and willfully wanting to sacrifice and be selfless so that others may prosper, so the well-being of others may improve. Father, we know that as regenerate people, <laughs> it, it doesn't come easy. Being sacrificial and selfless and generous doesn't come easy. But we just want to thank you for your word and we want to thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers us, that enables us to respond in obedience, to be compliant with what it means to be loving. And we also recognise, Lord, that there's no other more loving person than your son, Jesus. As he gives of himself, he withholds nothing, gives of his very self in order to purchase our redemption. We give you thanks afresh and we pray, Lord, that that would be something that is so ingrained in our thinking that it would translate into our behaviour, actions and the way we conduct ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.